a little imagination and a good sense of humor in the garden coming up next. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now, in today's show, we're going to focus on having a little fun, a touch of whimsy in the garden. The way I see it, life in general and gardens specifically wouldn't be much fun without a whimsical touch. In today's show, we'll visit Garvin Woodland Gardens near one of the oldest national parks in America. Also, I'll show you a beautiful and fun way to attract beneficial insects to your garden, as well as an interesting place to have a bathtub. I have this to share with you and much, much more. So stay with us. Come on. One aspect of gardening that one can't help but notice and appreciate is the economy of nature. Recycling and reusing is a basic premise found in the natural world and one that encourages me to be frugal or at least responsible with resources. I like to use natural objects in my interior spaces as well. One example would be a clothes rack that I built from fresh cut branches. I added a few birdhouses to give it a touch of whimsy and now I have a little birdhouse clothes rack to hang a bathrobe or a jacket on. I've also incorporated pressed flowers and foliage into the decor of my home by having them beautifully framed and then displayed. These examples are easy to create and will last for years to come. And of course, I use things that are just specific to the season, like bringing pumpkins inside, as well as Granny Smith apples, and even Osage oranges to decorate my mantles and tables. You can always tell when it's summer out here at the farm. When these daylilies begin to bloom, well, it's just a symbol of the season. You know, this is Hemerocallis fulva. It's a daylily that's been here, no telling how long on this place, and I just love it as a reminder of, of, of this old farm's past. It's also called a ditch lily. When I was growing up, that's what we called them because they would come up along the ditches and just about anywhere where the soil was just right. You know, it's amazing how things change out here with the seasons. Today we have daylilies, but just a few months ago, this whole area was filled with daffodils. Who couldn't love daffodils? Just look how lovely all of these are. When you see them bloom, you know that spring is not far away. They're a brave little flower. They flower often in the winter, and they can take a lot of cold weather, much cooler temperatures than many flowers. What I've planted here is a big drift of one variety called ice follies. I like it because of its white collar, a cream colored collar, and this slightly flattened uh, corona or trumpet in the center. It's a very easy flower to grow. Often people who come out here to the garden home retreat ask me, what do I do with my daffodils after they flower? And it's a very good question. What I like to do is allow them to just die back naturally. We don't cut them back at all. You see, you want the green foliage of the daffodil to persist, as well as the stem, so that it will recharge and reinvigorate the bulb underneath, so you'll have a flower next year. Now, one of the things you want to know about daffodils is that they need full sun. And even though we're under this great old post oak, one of the seven sisters out here at the farm, we still get plenty of sunlight under the limbs of this tree. The west is this direction, and so the light pours across them, really, both in the afternoon and in the morning, under these big boughs. Now, there are 12 divisions of daffodils. All of them have different shapes of bloom. 
And what I like to do is, in certain areas, plant lots of different varieties, but of course we didn't do that here. One of the reasons is because I love the view from this particular patch under these two sister oaks looking at the house because the color of the ice folly daffodil is very similar with its pale yellow and cream to the colors we used on the garden home retreat. It makes a beautiful picture. Now I want to show you a little project that I've been working on. It's all in the spirit of trying to grow food more responsibly, more organically. What I'm creating here in this eight foot path, and you can see it's loosely tilled and it runs the length of this fence, I'm going to plant an insectary. Now an insectary is nothing more than an area dedicated for the planting of flowers and plants that will support or aid beneficial insects. As you know, there are good bugs and bad bugs in a vegetable garden. And when we set out several months ago to clear this area and get it all ready with all the soil preparation and so forth, I was committed to doing it organically from the very beginning. So now we're at a place where I can actually start an insectary and try to support my good bug population. So what I've done here is I've worked up the soil lightly. We've added a little compost to keep the clay broken up. And now what I'm going to do is sow a range of seed. Many of them are wildflowers. You'll find Coreopsis in here, uh, some old familiar garden variety marigolds, the little tiny Thumbelina zinnias, all sorts of things. If you want a diverse population of beneficial insects, you want a diverse population of flowers, and that's what I'm doing. Now, in order for these to really take hold and grow, they need to make good soil to seed contact. And so what I've done is I've taken this bucket and just a few minutes ago, I filled it with seed and then I added some potting soil so I can get better distribution. Now my hope is to spread this seed out like this before the rains begin. We've just had a little thunderstorm blow up and this could be very fortuitous because the thing that these seed need next is a good soaking. Now you won't believe it, in just a few days, well, I'd say several days, we'll begin seeing some of these things coming up, and within 45 days or so, we'll have blooms, which will make these beneficial insects very happy. <music> I have to say, of all the rooms or spaces at the Garden Home Retreat, this is the one that I think most people gravitate toward. There are many reasons, but I think the first one we can take a look at is the view. From this second story sleeping porch, you can see this panoramic view of the Arkansas River Valley. Actually, there's a barge going up, which makes it very interesting. And you can see a lovely mountain range to the east and to the west. The sunrise out here is spectacular. If you look down in the garden, just look at those vitex in flower. When people come to visit me, those that don't know the vitex tree just cannot believe how beautiful they are. And I think we're seeing them in peak bloom today. I just love their tall, spiky flowers. They almost look like giant lavender trees. Okay, enough about the view. Let's focus on some of the more whimsical aspects of this room. I think what really catches people off guard is when they see this outdoor bathtub and shower. Now what's great about it, well it's a really old fashioned idea to begin with, but secondly, it's a great place to just kick back, put lots of bubbles in there, and when I have guests, bring out the rubber duckies and they have a blast. You see, there's a pipe here that runs the water, cold and hot, into the tub and then right up to the shower head. In the winter, I just simply drain this and when spring rolls around and it becomes warm enough, you just turn it on and let her rip. Now, what's fun about this is that there is a fabric that wraps it on the backside or shutters so you have plenty of privacy. Now, people have asked me, what about all of this fabric out here? How has it gone through the winter? Well, none of this has changed since last winter. What I used here is all indoor-outdoor fabrics as well as indoor outdoor rugs and they've held up beautifully. 
Even these bed covers and pillows are made of indoor outdoor fabric. They really are built to last. Now I have a series of three beds out here. So it's a great place to have a nap or even spend the night out on this sleeping porch. And above I've got ceiling fans. So if there's not enough breeze coming off the river, we've got fans to stir the air. And I also consider this a great room for summer camp for my house plants. I bring them out here in all different sizes, Diffenbachia, even a bay tree. Orchids love it, and it's a perfect place for terrariums. You know, there's some other things that help make this feel like a room. You know, the whole idea of the garden home retreat is blurring the lines between indoors and out, and a porch is a perfect place. The finish on the wall is a lime wash. We have lamps out here and artwork on the walls, as well as magazines and comfortable places to sit. So this room is really as comfortable as any room in the house. You know, there are all kinds of ways to have a little fun in the garden. What I'm doing here is I'm filling up this clay pot with a wonderful drought tolerant phlox. And the reason I'm using a drought tolerant phlox, as you can see, my container, which is rather whimsical, will only support this size container. Now, I love this chicken. Some friends surprised me for one of my birthdays when they delivered this to me, left it on my front porch. They know how much I love chickens, and it makes the neatest little container to hold a flower. As you can see, it's just made out of metal, a metal frame. And it's up to the plant to sort of fill it out. So you want to place it somewhere where you can see the form of the chicken. Now, if you think this is whimsical, you ought to take a look at some of the work of James Scallion. He's an ornamental iron worker, and he's created quite a fantasy land in a woodland garden. Welcome to the Gingerbread House and the Gingerbread family of people. We, we built our house and our people are all situated in the woods uh, at Garvin Woodland Gardens. Our gingerbread theme is, is much like the rest of the theme in the garden. We try our best to, to stay indigenous with our, our set pieces. They'll range from butterflies to turtles to koi fish. Turn the corner, it's always a new surprise. And of course, then you go into the candy cane lane and it's a really pretty soft area at night. Important locations, the ellipse is a big, that's where the toy soldiers are all there. The uh, elf house, which is just down the road, is another nice feature. You'll come into the, what we call the chip trail, and you'll come by a feature that is what we call the present, and it's a big giant present with a big bow and streamers coming off the top. And the whole trail and pathway is lit with chandeliers, five star, three star, and Tiffany chandeliers. We have some 16 cone flowers that are new this year, uh, eight growing tulips that are new this year. Um, we have, have, of course have our butterfly meadow and daisies that we're proud of. We have a new uh, feature this year, it's a trumpet vine. It's some 25 feet high. You come around one curve, you, you may see a turtle, you may see, you may see tulips grow. You turn the next corner, then you may see two giant wreaths with a huge tree showcased in the center of both of them. Uh, then you turn the next corner, you may see cone flowers. You may see deer. You may see koi fish. Uh, you may see teddy bears. We are, are in the process of trying to go more green. Uh, we're, we're trying to change our incandescent lighting over to LED lighting. It's uh, a lot friendlier electricity wise. The color schemes are important. Uh, we, we, we try to, we have areas that are soft in nature and, and serene, uh, and that's usually where our water features are. Uh, that way you have the, 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 the quiet and the, the peacefulness of the water and, and the softness of the lights. And those in combination give you a completely different outlook. And then you turn the corner and then, you know, the lights are going off and music is playing and uh, so there's 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 different there's different areas and it's all uh, done by color the crew itself we start in september we do spend some six thousand hours and probably um, 2500 to 3000 hours in volunteer work it's child friendly 
and uh, young and old can enjoy everything and every aspect of what we have here. Each trail that you turn and go down uh, takes you from one area to a surprise and a new area. And it, each corner that you turn, uh, there's another feature, there's another lighted area, and it, it, it seems to be never ending until you get back to where you started. And it's all in a woodland garden setting. Yep, I hear you. I just wanted to introduce you to a couple of my little friends. 23 of their little flock mates are back there in the back. This is a khaki Campbell duckling. And these two girls are about, oh, three weeks old. And I'm just setting up a little place for them to swim. Go on back in there if you want to. Good girl, good girl. And what I love about this particular duck is that they're not only comical to watch, but I think they're very beautiful with their almost coffee-colored bills and this beautiful sort of brown plumage. Soon they'll begin producing some feathers, but right now it's still down. They are great foragers of insects and slugs, and so we're gonna use them up in the big garden to help keep the garden clean. So they're gonna be a part of the pest removal program there. And then this particular breed is a very good egg layer. These little girls will lay about 200 eggs a year. Can you believe it? They lay a large white egg like a, like a, a legern, a white legern would lay. You've seen those before with the big floppy combs on them. They lay enormous eggs. But anyway, these ducks were very excited about having them. And I think as they get a little accustomed to their new place, they're gonna enjoy jumping in the water. Let's see what she does. Here we go, jump in, here you go. Can I give it a try? Whoops, boop. I think she's gonna like it. Good girl. Well, this is the part of the show where I take photographs that you send to me and examine them. Take a look at what the landscape looks like and what it could possibly become. Today we're looking at a house in Madison, Mississippi. It belongs to Karen and Thomas. As you can see, it looks like a relatively new house. Now, Karen says that she loves the English style. She's really sick and tired of these uh, big shrubs here. And you can see the house almost looks like it's floating on a barge of plants. Um, this is Hawthorne, this looks like holly. She doesn't like the holly over here. Um, I'd have to say that this crepe myrtle really blocks the view of what looks to be a fairly handsome portico there. Um, and then this is sort of boring here, and I'm not sure about that corner, but I think we can sure help. So why don't we get started with just a few ideas that I think will add a lot of color, because she mentions that she really likes color. And the other thing that you need to understand is this gets full western sun. So whatever we include here has got to really be able to take some heat. Now, first of all, let's just talk about um, the layout, the balance and so forth here. This, imagine this crepe myrtle gone, but what if we came out here into the lawn here, we came up with another tree here. Maybe that's a crepe myrtle. Maybe we dig that white one up and move it. And then we frame the front of the house with another crepe myrtle here. So then this nice entryway then becomes a focal point. And then what if we come over here and frame the ends of the house? thinking evergreen versus deciduous. These are deciduous, they're gonna lose their leaves, the crepe myrtles. What if we came over here and we did a beautiful vitex tree, maybe a multi-trunk vitex here for blooming just before the crepe myrtles start? And then for spring, what if back here we did a snowball viburnum that comes in back here on the back with those big, giant, white, almost hydrangea-like blooms and let's do another one right back here. You can see that would be back in this bed over here. All right, so we're balancing the property. Now let's bring in some evergreens. So I'm gonna change colors. I'm gonna to go to green here. And what if we used some Sasanqua camellias right here? How would that, that'd be great. They bloom in the fall, it's evergreen. We could do another Sasanqua here on the corner there, another Sasanqua here, and another Sasanqua here on this corner. 
like that. So see, you get this rhythm going across there with that beautiful camellia. And I would use sort of a blush pink because it would work beautifully with the brick. And then what if we decided to do some roses over this arched window? And maybe that's a new dawn rose with its pale pink. And what if we did another rose over this one, way up like this, where it just fills in. And those will bloom all summer long. You're going to get most of your bloom in the spring, but they'll do very well for you in Mississippi. Now, the next thing I would do is, I agree, I would remove these shrubs along here. And I would anchor it with a really nice boxwood. Remember, our bed shape is going to change. Why don't I change colors here for just a minute and use some yellow? So our bed may change like this, and it may create some sort of serpentine undulating form like this that sweeps around like that, okay? And then what we could do is come back and do a boxwood here and a boxwood here, and then do a boxwood border all the way around like this, using a little boxwood like one of the microphyllas, winter green, something like that. And then on the inside, what you could do, Karen, is here's where we could have a lot of fun with some roses in here, okay? Some of those wonderful pale pink, ever-blooming shrub-type roses all across here, and even a big splash of them here. And then behind the window, there's some dwarf forms of Laurapetalum. So I'm going to use some red here just to illustrate that and some Laura Petalum there. It's an evergreen shrub, a little bit of Laura Petalum here and here. And then in this courtyard, do something kind of fun and exciting in this space. That could be a simple ground cover. Maybe we do something like Asian Jasmine or Vinca Minor with that little blue flower. And then don't go so large with plants in here. Maybe we just use an Akuba Japonica on the side there, and maybe something the same over here on this side. And there's where you could have some beautiful perennials in here. Maybe we fill that in with a pink colored daylily or a whitish colored daylily all in here so you would have a lot of bloom in spring. Well, anyway, there's some ideas that would certainly transform this house. Good luck with your project. You've got a beautiful place. That's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Now, one last thought on whimsy. If you've never grown gourds, you really ought to give it a try. It's a lot of fun. And gourds are a great way to get a kid involved in gardening. So if you've got a grandchild, a niece, nephew, a child, or even a neighbor's child, get them involved in gardening by growing some gourds. From one gourd this size, look at all of these seed. And guess what? All of these behind me and in this basket came from just two plants. So make sure you have plenty of sun and a lot of room for the gourds to grow because they'll grow like no tomorrow. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. <laughs>